so all of have joined all of us have joined a medical institute with a dream to become a big doctor and to become a big otologist all of us dream uh, to treat deafness so when we hear we feel happy but when this hearing goes off we are sad we do not know what to do for ourselves and for what for our patients oh what a situation but we have an answer to this now and the answer is cochlear implants it gives you the ear to hear so what are cochlear implants this this is a device all of us know that it has got two parts the part one is the external part and the part two is the internal part the external part helps us to receive sound process it and send it to the internal part which transmits the information to the intracochlear electrode so how what is the principle of working of a cochlear implant it works on the same principle that our uh, cochlea does it has similar frequency arrangement the basal electrodes will help you to hear the high frequency high pitch sounds and the more apical ones electrodes will help you to hear the lower frequency or the lower pitch sounds uh, for a normal hearing person we need around 35000 um, auditory nerve fiber but for a clear implant we will around 10000 fibers now how work so we have a system wherein we have a cochlear nerve the proximal end of the cochlear nerve the information then goes to the cochlear nucleus superior olivary nucleus through the lateral lamniscus to the inferior colliculus and then to the medial geniculate body so these seven structures will give you seven waves which we record on a bara finally through thalamus the information goes to the auditory cortex and only when at this level we have a central processing appropriately done we are able to hear there are other systems but that is out of the scope of this class so then once it is implanted it is just not that implant ho gaya and we are done no we have to keep on programming the implant the current level so this is called as the programming wherein the current levels are set and also we have a vigorous auditory verbal therapy going on either for the adults or for the children so let us see how this cochlear implant has developed so there have been five eras initially there was four runners then some experimentations done by pioneers then the feasibility test evaluated and then we got some commercial implants coming in on the multi channel electrodes then finally it was development of the brain stem implant so we see here so volta was one person uh, we all of us know what is volt so he had put two metal rods one in the right ear and one in the left ear and he got a difference of minus 50 volts on this and one current was passed a direct current was passed and he could hear a boom in the in the ears similarly dushan did it but he used alternating current in this way every scientist had done some work recording of cochlear microphonics then concept of electrophonic hearing then it was dudley who invented the vocoder vocoder is nothing but a real time voice synthesizers until date the speech processing that we use depends on the vocoder okay dijorno did the transcutaneous uh, electrocoiling so in this way uh, then came the era where uh, development of uh, implants was done uh, by and then house invented the facial resis approach then uh, simon uh, was responsible for deciding the tonotopy in the cochlea similarly then safety and evaluation issues were addressed by some other scientists then multi channel implants uh, came into commercial use and today we stand here where we have more than 300 million implants cochlear implants and a few thousand brain stem implants also so this is how it has come to this level now let us understand to whom can we give this so any patient who has got severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss and not benefited with acoustic hearing aids can be a candidate for cochlear implant and hearing aid should be used for at least 3 months right now when we talk of adults if the hearing aid is not giving them benefit of 30% on greater on sds at mcl or if the children do not have age appropriate skills for speech language listening they have got uh, according to their development stage and cognitive then they should undergo the work for work up for cochlear candidacy implant candidacy 
but there are some contraindications too. What are they? So if there is no nerve, no hearing possible, no implant possible, no cochlear implant, we will go for a ABI. Then cochlear aplasia or Michel deformity means absence of inner ear or if the deafness is of central origin, then cochlear implant won't work. Sometimes we are like outcome may or may not be there. Like if it's a thin nerve, hypoplastic nerve, or if there is ossification because there is a lot of spiral ganglion loss. So we do not know how much um, information will be perceived or some psychological issues. So we have to be careful in such situations. But, uh, but if we decide we have to work up with this candidate, so what do we do? So you have to assess, assess the candidate's abilities, disabilities, and his language and communication abilities. So then for this, we need a big team. The big team is the cochlear implant team consisting of surgeons, psychologists, uh, and then radiologists, then scientists who will help us to get better devices, a speech language therapist, audiologist, pediatrician, teachers for the deaf, and then most importantly, parent participation is important. And then maybe there may be some people who are actually totally dependent on their auditory stimuli for their special awareness. And then those cases, we may have to go for a bilateral implant. So like here you have implant on either sides. How does it help? So it avoids the head shadow effect. See, if you are listening from here and if you are getting speech here and there's noise here, so that speech goes there, it gets... Uh, the level gets low, so this head shadow effect can be avoided. Then there will be speech, the speech and noise ratio, signal to noise ratio that we call, because if there is speech on one side, noise on other side, then there will be difficulty in hearing. So bilateral implant will work here also, then localization is better. So in all a summation effect is good for, especially for people who are totally dependent on auditory stimuli. Now, how do you evaluate a deaf child? So there are multiple investigations that we do. Most importantly, auditory brainstem and autoacoustic emissions. Apart from that, electrocochleography, ASSR, behavioral observation, audiometry, visual enforcement, audiometry, distraction test, play audiometry, and peer turn audiometry. So all of them are important. And according to the age, we will use this. So like up to six months, you use electrophysiological test and BOA. If child is 5 to 36 months, then we have VRA. 6 to 18 months, we do a distraction test. Performance test of play audiometry is 2 to 5 years. Peer tone audiometry, 3 years onwards, anytime you can do. And then auditory speech perception test. So it is important for a child or an adult to have some vocabulary for this test to happen. The details are out of scope of this class, I believe. So how do you use OA? So in newborns, if there are risk factors, we will do both screening OA and ABR. If no, then OA suffices. And if the child passes, then I don't think we need to work further. But if there is refer, then according to the flow chart, we'll have to uh, further work up with the child and see if they, he fits into the candidacy. When we work up with the adult, then what? So we only do certain tests which are important and in an adult there are some more tests which become important like ABR, autocaustic emissions, pure tone audiometry and special auditory test and auditory speech perception test too because in an adult we'll have to differentiate between a cochlear and a retrocochlear pathology. That is why these tests become more important. Now there may be some special cases like in elderly. What happens? In elderly now with the growing age, we'll have more of elderly people and they are, have a cognition deficit and they will not be as easily acceptable to deafness uh, uh, or they will not be very easily understanding things because their cognition is less. So it's a vicious cycle, low cognition and deafness. Deafness promotes low cognition and low cognition again uh, disturbs the hearing. Then if there is residual hearing, we have to be very careful. Then we have to use electroacoustic stimulation like high frequency we'll hear through a cochlear implant and for low frequencies we can use acoustic stimulation. In far advanced autosclerosis also a cochlear implant is a good choice. Although there may be some issues with uh, non-auditory facial stimulation, but we can flag off those electrodes and uh, work with it. New fibromatosis type 2, uh, once the tumor is out and if the cochlear nerve is intact, we can give CI. 
and sometimes even if patient does not fit into any of the criteria uh, we can use a ci also in single sided deafness we have and tinnitus this uh, is a good option for uh, adults to continue their working in children with additional dis disabilities or ansd and anatomical abnormalities again um, we'll do the appropriate investigations to decide whether they fit into the candidacy or not so assessment another very important point is medical so in children anesthesia is difficult option because they have lot of small small issues like narrow nares large tongue high larynx similarly in geriatric population we have issues like hypertension diabetes and maybe some more other morbidity so that is the challenge for anesthetist then what is the challenge for otologist the challenge is if there is glue or secretory otitis you need to clear it uh, implant can be done with a grommate if there is no active infection if that is active infection like a perforation you need to close it or if there is a cholestatoma you need to handle it sometimes patients may have a mrm already done in such cases we need to do a blind sac closure you need to obliterate the cavity and uh, along with the implant so that is how it works so the barrier has to be there otherwise we know infection can lead to meningitis or infection can lead to uh, wound infection also which may ultimately result in extrusion or explantation so then the next thing comes is the importance of radiology radiology is very important because it gives a idea about the cochlear vestibular anomalies that can preclude implantation or luminal obstruction we may not be able to put the electrode or we may have to use a dummy before we put the electrode or sometimes there may be additional um, things like uh, um, uh, uh, some other uh, and additional things like uh, infection which we need to control or which may have we'll have to find out before we take the case in the ot so what do we do so when we see the mastoid we need to see the size of the mastoid whether it is small adequate what are the problems if the cavity is having some haziness or it is clear or there is any other thing which we are not expecting normally is it well pneumatized is it sclerotic what is the state of the cavity then what is the state of the middle ear cavity how much if, is there any haziness are the ossicles normal the state of the jugular bulb it is normally placed dehiscent high the facial canal how is it it is is it on the coming on to the promontory or it is like uh, dehiscent sigmoid if it is less than 1.5 cm with the esc then we will call it antipost round window how is it positioned uh, and then the internal auditory meters then cochlear anomalies as described by levin scenario glue or the internal auditory canal or what is the state of the labyrinth so these things we are supposed to see when we do a radiology now uh, mri is equally important because it will give us the areas of obliteration by seeing how much is fluid is there and is it a complete obliteration then we'll have to go for a abi the internal auditory meter segment again of the facial nerve we'll have to see how it is because in cochlear vestibular anomalies the facial also gets displaced all of us know this so this is our key area when we do a cochlear implantation uh, the facial recess and the fossa incubus forms its superior body the lateral is the corda and the medial is the facial and this is what we assess uh, we must see when we do a um, so radiology or a ct scan of the temporal bone so like i'll just explain why this is important is suppose if this is the length of your body of incus up to the short process coming into the fossa incubus you just extend it right this much the same length you extend it here and this is the area we where you will get your facial that is the expected and always remember this point of intersection will point will be the center of your uh facial recess opening so if your this is your facial recess opening this will be the center so fish jitna uh, the how much in front is the posterior canal wall same length behind you will get the facial nerve so now when we talk of inner ear we should know what we are seeing so as you can see this is dissected from a human temporal bone the inner ear it has a base the cochlea has a basal turn the middle turn and the apical turn the lateral semicircular canal the superior and the posterior semicircular canal and we can very well see the facial nerves comes in between the cochlea and the 
vestibular structures or the lateral semicircular canal and see this is the horizontal part of the facial nerve and this is the vertical part coming a second you know lying in feromedial to the lateral semicircular canal dome we see the round window and we see this oval window as well so from these uh, we'll just go through like uh, it is difficult, like I cannot explain you in this class all about how the anomalies look in a radiology, but we'll just see how the normal structures lose, look in a radiology. So we have this vestibule and the lateral canal. This is our lateral canal in this dissected bone. This is the basal turn of the cochlea, the eye internal auditory canal. Similarly, we can see the two ends of the superior canal and the two ends of the posterior canal, this being the crust commune. So let us see how the superior semicircular canal looks. So this is what is called as rabbit ear appearance when you do it in a coronal section, the superior canal and the lateral canal. In axial section, we'll see the dome. It looks like this. And on a sagittal section, you see this extension. So this is the superior semicircular canal. Similarly, lateral canal on axial sections give you a signet ring appearance. This is the molar tooth appearance that you see when you do a corona, uh, see it in, on a coronal section and again a rabbit ear that we've seen on a sagittal section. The posterior canal will look, will have these two ends uh, on a axial section. This is again, it's a sagittal and this is the coronal section where you, we see the posterior canal. So normally this is where we have to locate the posterior semicircular canal. Any anomalies, this will be disturbed. So then again, cochlea, we see it is called as a stack of coin, the basal turn, the middle turn, and the apical turn. And this is the promontory that is formed by the basal turn. Then cochlear aqueduct runs from the lower part, anterior inferior to the round window up to the, sorry, up to the, and opens near the jugular bulb up to the intracranial cavity. And the vestibular aqueduct goes and opens towards the Posterior semicircular canal. So these can be again dilated in anomalies and they will be responsible for any paralymph leak or CSF leak intraoperatively if we get a gusher. This is our internal auditory canal. This can be thin if the cochlear nerve is narrow. This can be dilated. Sometimes this aperture is not there in cochlear vestibular anomaly. So all these things we'll have to understand when we do a radiology in terms of cochlear implant. Then crista falciform is just divides the ISE into superior inferior part. So this is what you see on a coronal section and on an axial section, a part of it is only seen. Now when we do MRI, we see the internal auditory canal, the facial nerve and the vestibulocochlear nerve. And when we see it in a section, all four nerves can be seen, the facial, the cochlear, superior vestibular, inferior vestibular. And this we call it, call it as uh, seven up and poke down. That is the way we remember it. Superior, inferior, we can always remember. Not at all a big issue. Then in the cochlea, we need to see the modulus, whether it is present, absent. It can be triangular. It can be oval. It can be diamond shaped. Now, the osseous spiral lamella that runs from the modulus can also has to be seen and the interscalar septum is also uh, can also be identified. And this white tells you that there is fluid in the cochlea. If there is no fluid, it will go black. The hyperluminescence will go away. So that is where the MRI becomes important. So again, we see the cochlear nerve going right into the modulus and this is the inferior vestibular nerve going towards the posterior semicircular canal. Superior vestibule, this is just a scan to show you like the nerve getting, facial nerve going here and the superior vestibular nerve coming to the vestibule. The inferior vestibular nerve coming towards the posterior semicircular canal and, uh, and the cochlear going into the cochlea. And you can see one branch that is the singular nerve. So the facial nerve has six major segments and each can be disturbed when you have a cochlear vestibular anomaly. We will quickly go through that. So in the, like when it starts from the first genu, the labyrinthine part then goes into the um, tympanic cavity, the horizontal part, and then goes down. And that is the mastoid part. Within the CPA system, it is again, this MRI had shown you. So it runs from the CP angle up to the entry into the IM. And this again, the four nerves that we have seen already. 
now labyrinthine segment and genu can be seen so like here is your labyrinthine segment this one will be the labyrinthine segment this is the entry of the internal alternator the facial is going from there very th small part labyrinthine segment the tympanic horizontal segment and then under the lateral semicircular canal it becomes vertical to form the mastoid segment so this we have already done the mastoid segment as you can see the vertical part now the anomaly so this has been uh, given by levens and reglu and so it could be a complete labyrinthine aplasia that we call as michel or absent uh, labyrinth rudimentary otosis so incomplete or a very small otic capsule but does not here cochlear aplasia so cochlea is not there common cavity round ovoid cystic structure for cochlea and vestibule a common cavity there is no division so in such cases you will have one cochlear vestibular nerve you may not have a different cochlear and a vestibular nerve in cochlear hyperplasia you have small size cochlea incomplete partition again the cochlea is cystic and uh, it does have a modulus but the interscalar septa are missing part incomplete partition 2 so you have only one and a half turn incompletion incomplete partition type 3 so modulus is also absent and interscalar septa are also absent so going into the complete detail uh, will like take lot of time so we have i'm just going through this table right now and enlarged vestibular aqueduct you can see it if it is more than 1.5 cm at the midpoint then you will call it as enlarged vestibular aqueduct and cochlear aperture anomalies it may be narrow absent as seen in ip3 so this is how a normal cochlea will look cochlear aplasia with a normal vestibule and there is no cochlea but the vestibule is dilated then you have a common cavity so you have some part of the cochleo vestibular organ in front of the iac okay if cochlea is absent you will not have anything in front of the iac so it is incomplete partition type 1 where you have the modulus type 2 where you have one and a half turns and type 3 where there is no modulus and interscalar septa are also missing in hypoplasia you have a bird like cochlea a small one then a uh, hypoplasia type 2 again you have a small size cochlea and interscalar septa are missing and a small hypoplastic cochlea with one and a half turn is type 3 in order to understand how a cochlea imp so when we if we want to know how a cochlear implant works then we must know how normally we hear so if you see here the uh, impulses are uh, the air is coming the conduction is happening the tympanic membrane is moving and then when this moves all our three ossicles move the inner ear fluid will move and then that will stimulate the spiral ganglion cell and help us hearing but what and but what and when when you have a cochlear implant then what happens so there is internal part there is external part that works and what is happening is like whenever there is sound the microphone picks up the sound the speech processor will process it into electric stimuli through the transmitter coil it will go towards the receiver coil from there there is a internal circuitry which will transmit it further through the array into the inner ear so and that is how when there is a stimuli the electrode will stimulus gives stimulus and your nerve gets stimulated that is how a cochlear implant works now we know that there is external part that has microphone sound processor and transmitter coil microphone sorry microphone sound processor and transmitter coil then internal receiver stimulator again it has a receiver coil uh so internal circuitry and a magnet in both sides so this magnet keeps the two parts connected and through this transmitter coil to the receiver coil there is a radio frequency transmission and that helps us to hear and the intracochlear electrode gets stimulated by the sound now this electrode can be placed perimodular so if this is a modular it could be modular hugging it could be lateral wall like this or it could be mid scalar neither close to the modulus nor close to the uh, lateral wall so these are the two three types which are uh, promoted or manufactured by various companies now this electrode should be placed in the scala tympani so now let us see what are the steps of operation so this is what is our final goal we should be able to see the round window and open it so incisions can be of various varieties a c shaped j shaped what normally is used is a lazy s shaped incision uh, 
Then we do a cortical mastoidectomy. So this is your posterior canal wall, the temporalis line, and a tangent joint to through this. So you get your triangle of attack, the Macuban triangle. And when you drill it out, then you will reach the antrum. This is your editors to the antrum. This is your posterior canal wall, which is very well thinned. We see the incus, and this incus is sitting in the fossa incudis. The lateral semicircular canal bulge can be seen here. So this is the next step. Now, once we have opened the antrum, we have identified our incus, we'll drill the bed. Now, before we drill the bed, we'll need to create a pocket. So we put the periosteum elevator inside this muscle tissue and with retractors, we lift it and then we'll drill the bed. We'll also drill a channel with a hook here. Under the hook, our electrodes will be placed. So then we'll identify the facial nerve here. Once the facial nerve is identified, we'll open anterior inferior to the facial nerve. We'll try to find out the IS joint, the stapedius tendon, the pyramid and the round window niche also. Now, in such case, we'll have to further open it, extend the PT. So we and then when you start drilling this niche, you may get a round window. In this case, it is ossified, but we'll see the actual surgical video. So here we are trying to. See, we have this is our incus and just as I said, incus jitna hai, same extended beyond and we should get our facial nerve here. Canal wall has to be adequately thinned. It can be made paper thin and you will have to thin it as much like so that you are able to see into the structure. So now you can start seeing the pink of the facial nerve. This is where we are seeing the pink of the facial nerve and we are opening the facial recess just entire inferior to this and gradually we'll be into the middle ear. So once we open up the middle ear, then the first thing we need to identify is our pyramid, the stapedius and the IS joint. And we know that round window cannot be more than two millimeter away or two millimeter posterior inferior to the stapes. So let us see now. So this is, you can very well see the pink of the facial now. And see, this is our stapedius, the pyramid. And here is your IS joint. So we'll just palpate it from this side, the incus, and we'll see this move. So we know that this is our IS joint. And here is your round window. Once we have seen the round window, we should be able to adequately expose it. So we, we have just extended the posterior tympanotomy and we are working to just uh, uh, remove the overhang to see the niche. Now we have to be careful. In the superior part, there is the basilar membrane. The round window membrane is very close to the basilar membrane and the interosseous uh, lamella. So we have to be careful not to hit it. So once we see the round window membrane, we'll perforate it. And then through the round window membrane, we will inject some steroid into the cochlea. So once we have injected the steroid, uh, after adequate drilling, then we'll prepare it for putting the electrode. So this is a round window niche and here, we will open it so you can see the membrane. I will open it a little bit more so that you are, sometimes what happens is uh, before we can actually put in the needle, it just gets opened up. So I think, and once you have opened the round window, we will put the electrode into the round window. So there it goes. So once the electrode is in place, we'll take the soft tissue. This soft tissue we'll, uh, we have already taken when we were giving the incision. From there, we take some fat or connective tissue so that we can achieve adequate seal. So all around the electrode, you should have enough space. Your opening should be wide enough to allow you to seal it with uh, the soft tissue. So you have to like every manufacturer has their own specifications as to how much uh, electrode can be put into the cochlea. So once we have met that level, you can see here the um, uh, mark has been coming on the post on the border of the posterior tympanotomy. And now we will seal it with the soft tissue. 
सो द सॉफ्ट टिश्यू स्टॉप्स एनी गशर एनी सी एस एफ लीक और पेरिलिम्फ लीक एट द सेम टाइम इट विल हेल्प अस टू कीप अवर इलेक्ट्रोड फिक्सड देयर सो द चांस ऑफ इट कमिंग आउट गेटिंग एक्सक्लूडेड आर ऑल्सो मिनिमाइज सो विल पुट सम फैट देयर द फैट दैट वी हैड ऑलरेडी टेकन वेन यू गेव द इंस्टीट्यूशन so a part of it has come out we'll again put it back completely in sometimes this bounce back is seen so we have to reposition it and i think i will just go on to the so this is the fat being plugged into the cavity and see now all around we'll have this fat plugging so once this is done all all around 360 degrees then we'll fix up the extra electrode into the mastoid and put it under the hook here and then close the wound in layers so that is how we have achieved a good positioning of the device once this is done we will take a intraop x-ray to see the position of the cochlea always i do it and it is recommended to do it this is a case where we did a bilateral simultaneous implant and this is how we give the bandage to the child and over it we will give a crepe bandage also so that there is no risk of hematoma formation so how do we decide the outcomes so outcomes depend lot on the op what age it was implanted when we talk of a child so for optimal benefit we have to implant it before 3 years so these children will do as good as our normal hearing children although this age is considered to be suitable for implant but they will always have a delayed language development and after this age things are difficult because the cortical uh, the cortex that gives have maximum has so much of plasticity that is uh, reduces with age so neural plasticity of the brain is lost with age they will not learn to speak as good and that is why the phrase goes that the deaf mutes because the deaf cannot talk but when it comes to adults the most important thing is the duration of deafness of course with age the number of spiral cell ganglion reduce they will have limited benefit with the hearing aid and other medical considerations so with age the spiral cell ganglion uh, population goes down and the number of years of deprivation of hearing also give you poorer outcomes because in postlingual the system is programmed we uh, we get better results if uh, we are doing it in adults and in prelinguals programming is required so they have to be done in time some special consideration binaural hearing as i have already explained electroacoustic hearing again there are two things so you have high frequency hearing with the device and you have a low frequency hearing with the acoustic stimulation then till adults in general will not have very good music perception although newer implants are coming which can help us in a better music perception then hearing preservation as i told you this is a sky slope audiogram as we call it so for high frequency we have cochlear implant and for low frequency you have hearing aid and then challenging situations like labyrinthine ossifications or in cases with meningitis or in cases with malformations we will have a different situation and we'll have to accordingly handle them what can be the complications so i have uh, given some pictures which are commonly seen complications and we'll have we'll have a whole big list of major and minor complications so wound infection yes it can happen and then you may have to actually remove the device so the device gets excluded then facial palsy it can happen sometimes they can be like double facial nerve as you can see here bifid facial nerve you can see two facial nerves coming out and this facial nerve is very close to the burr that we are using so you may not have actually damaged it but even the heat of the burr if it touches the facial nerve so how do we do it so we use a long shoulder bulb burr and then we use plenty of irrigation when we are working on the facial nerve so this is the way we can protect it trauma yes fall can give you this kind of a situation although we do not have these 
in plants now or trauma can lead to a magnet displacement also you can see the magnet has come from the central position it has been displaced inferiorly so you have to reposition it or sometimes there can be device failure or because if it's incomplete insertion there could be kinking if you are trying to forcibly put in sometimes occasionally you can get a tip fold over or a scalar translocation like it's moved from scalar tympani to the scalar vestibuli or this electrode has migrated out so these are the various complications that we give, get but to complete the list there uh, yeah one i one i'll tell you like we had this patient uh, ossified cochlea and while drilling we got a big paralymph gusher because by mistake i open the modulus while drilling for the ossification so sometimes you can get this intraoperatively also so like meningitis csf leakage as i shown you in this small video facial palsy sometimes hematoma or abscess so we have to control the bleeding so it could be from a mastoid emissary vein you can control it with a uh, bone dust or if it is from the dura you can use a surgery cell as a situation b so these are the various complications extrusion we have taught tinnitus vertigo occasionally seen device failure we have talked electrode positioning we have talked there can be some minor complications because corda forms one of the boundary of fossa incudis we may by chance damage it facial palsy can be transient then sometimes hemifacial swelling and tear swelling because of the tight bandage so loosen it some retroauricular emphysema not seen but yes it is mentioned otitis media is not due to ci but due to some other causes what i go tennis all settle with time so for children close to normal development opportunities and attendance at mainstream schools can be achieved with cochlear implants and for adults they can return to pre hearing loss functioning including their continuation of employment and telephone use now there are some new technologies like tiki so but with tiki we have a problem that the microprocessor and the microphone how will you avoid picking up the movements of the uh, sounds coming from the movement of the muscle or from the breathing so that is still going on drug eluting electrodes can deliver drugs like um, neuro stimulants or steroids new insertion techniques yes some newer devices are coming new electro designs are coming which are less traumatic and uh, they like when we have to do a second or a third implant in a child then they will be less traumatic to the uh, cochlea and neuro methods of neuro stimulation uh like use of neuromodulators and inner ear treatment in terms of we can have some gene therapy or some stem cell therapy so that so remember that we are just taking a few steps forward and this will translate into miles of travel to reach the destination so like impaired hearing is like this but when you have a smooth uh, normal hearing your life becomes as smooth as this so yes for me ear is the organ of education so i call it e for education employment encouragement enjoyment and lot of energy i hope uh, i have delivered something uh, interesting and knowledgeable to you thank you for listening hello हेलो क्या मैं मेरा ऑडिबल सो एनीवन एनीबॉडी हैज क्वेश्चंस so yes candidacy criteria uh, i have already explained in one of my slides so for children under the age of 3 years we'll assess them through the various audiological assessment tests uh, 
and the main being the uh, OE and the Bera, then accordingly we'll proceed. And for adults, if their speech discrimination score is below 30, then we'll have to work up with the candidacy like radiological investigations and the loss is cochlear or retrocochlear through the audiological test. And uh, we are using implants from cochlear from AB. We have done some implants from Neuralec also. So all implants are good, but uh, the auditory verbal therapy remains the mainstay of the uh, outcome. Like if you have got a good um, auditory verbal therapy with the whole team participating, you will have very good outcomes. So changing the implant not required always. It depends upon the need. So like even the basic implants where we were using a 802 processor are working with the children. But uh, if you want newer advances like you want a phone link then or you want a Bluetooth uh, teaching devices, then you need to upgrade on the implant. And these implants have a warranty of at least 10 years the internal part. And we children usually carry on up even up to 30 years. We need not change them unless uh, the needs are increasing or they are not able to cope up with the amount of hearing they are getting with the CI. And also it depends on how much they can afford. So taking another class uh, would be by request to the um, organize only organizers only. So. Yeah, I can take a class on radiology also because that happens to be my favorite subject. So I think the board can decide on taking another class. Yeah, so if you want me to share it, I can share it making a PDF because right now it is on a keynote. So it would be difficult. I think uh, everybody cannot open a keynote. And you'll have to tell me what is the WhatsApp group if you want me to share it. OK, fine. I'll try to share it. Can unilateral case of profound SNHL at age 14, secondary to labyrinthine fistula? Can, yeah, a cochlear implant can benefit such children if they are postlingual, as I told you already. See, you cannot program the auditory system of a 14 year old child. OK, so it has to be pre programmed. The internal circuitry has to be established already. At 14, we the brain plasticity is not good, so we cannot get that kind of neural connectivity and networking developing as we get it at a younger age where you have a lot of plasticity. But yes, if the child has a speech, he is not been auditory uh, been under auditory deprivation for more than two three years, we can definitely give him a benefit at age 14 also. But he has to have language that is important. So follow up is with a surgeon. Uh, yeah, and uh, I remove stitches at around uh, 10 days. And after that, it is mostly the therapist and the audiologist who are involved in the therapy sessions and the mapping part. But yes, if there is any issue surgical, we are there to handle it. Sometimes patient get edema, sometimes the magnet is strong, so the skin gets roughened. So we have to take care accordingly. So like all questions are important, but yes, you need to know what anomalies. How will you detect the anomalies like which anomaly looks how and what is the management? So that was the chart I showed you that was from a paper from Levent Senereglu and it is very easily available on the net or um, 
like you can may ask your question to me i can just give you my mail address if you have any issues then i think aap mujhe personally if there is anything i can help you and the other thing become important is like about other newer developments coming in the cochlear implant like uh, optical stimulation is coming up like we are using electrodes going right there even optical stimulation helps so that is it dear twinies you have time you may ask you may type your questions in the chat box okay taking presentation will not help you may type your questions comments your doubts if any in the chat box please thank you So I think uh, any other questions? Are oh, we are done? हेलो no see brain stem implants uh, do not have a very good outcome right from the day it has been in use because the placement of the brain stem implant in the floor of the fourth ventricle as it is you have to be very very meticulous with that and cochlear implants is not a, like a plate like thing no it is tonotopically prepared the brain stem implants are not prepared that way it's like a flat plate of electrode which goes and sits uh, on, near the foramen of lushka but as i told you the cochlear implant works on the principle of tonotopic arrangement so it has multiple wires like if you have a 24 channel electrode so there are 22 electrodes of different lengths and each electrode is programmed for a particular frequency and that ends at one point so so one electrode would be very long the next one would be smaller smaller and accordingly the electrode has been allocated a particular frequency to which it gets stimulated uh, brain stem uh, implants are not manufactured that way so they do not have that tonotopicity or like the cochlear implants or our cochlea has so ci i will not have a problem of course we can have advancements that is a different issue Dear twinies, we still have ten minutes. If you have any doubts, questions, you may type, please. So, when you have a case of labyrinthitis ossificans, we need to know the etiology. It could be meningitis, or it could be post-traumatic, and then accordingly, we'll have to see the MRI of the patient. So, MRI will tell you about the. Uh, ossification and the fluid-filled status of the uh, labyrinth. So, if you have it, and according to the stage of the ossification or according to the stage of labyrinthitis, we'll have to see a T1 or a T2 weighted images. So, normally T2 weighted images would be like showing hyper intensity when in the active phase, or otherwise T1 weighted images are seen. 
so accordingly you will come to know that if there is fibrosis fib much of fibrous tissue or much of fluid tissue or it is already calcified one thing so once you have done your radiological study then when you take the case for implantation suppose you decide ki no he can be implanted then there are dummy devices available so you do not directly open up the electrode you will get the dummy from the manufacturer itself so when you understand that yes i have got a lumen if you uh, then instead of putting the electrode the active electrode directly we'll use the dummy first so we'll try to put in the dummy and if the dummy goes well then we know that there is enough lumen and we can now open up our device and in such cases we'll open up the device and then put it but yes sometimes even the dummy gets obstructed then we are not supposed to do any uh, any active implantation in such cases so if you have a patient with meningitis they needs early ct mri uh, because labyrinthitis ossification can develop even in 3 weeks and these children if possible should be implanted bilaterally simultaneously so that uh, we reduce the chance of other side getting affected and the spiral ganglions getting destroyed in the process of uh, inflammation and ossification hello so do we have any other questions hello yes ma'am there you know query ah uh, there you know query man in the chat box there is a there is a query in the chat Hello. box yeah ma'am there, there is a query in the chat box
yes so cochlear implant does work in ansg and uh, we have to be like uh, with their auditory verbal therapy we have to be more aggressive with them it does work cochlear implant is indicated in cases of ansd there were multiple papers on that Ma'am, can we wind up the session now? Ma'am? Page 13th of December. Ma'am, am I audible? Dr. Snail? So there was a question on bilateral cochlear implant. When can we do? So every time you have a patient with bilateral hearing loss, you must try to do a bilateral implant. And simultaneous implant is always better than a sequential implant uh, if uh, financially and medically the patient is fit. Every case of bilateral SNHL must be given the possibility of a bilateral cochlear implant because as I said it has got three effects so the squelch effect the head shadow effect and it reduces the it improves the localization of the sound so that question was missed I think I am not audible. Huh. You are not audible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That is what I was waiting for. TK. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, all training faculty members, for joining this session.